Martin Sieber is a chef, author, speaker, and National Geographic Fellow, and he is passionate, passionate, passionate about restoring our relationships with the ocean, the land, and with each other through my favorite meal of the day, dinner. He believes food is a crucial way for us to connect with the ecosystems, people, and cultures of our world. Sieber explores these themes through helpful, planet-friendly recipes in his first book, For Cod and Country, and as host of both the National Geographic web series, CookWise, and the three-part Ovation TV series, In Search of Food. A graduate of the Culinary Institute of America, an executive chef at some of DC's most celebrated restaurants, Siever is known for his devotion to quality, culinary innovation, and sustainability. In 2009, Esquire magazine named him Chef of the Year. Siever works on ocean issues with National Geographic's Mission Blue to increase awareness and inspire action. He also collaborates with DC Central Kitchen, the School Nutrition Association, the Center for Health and the Global Environment at Harvard Medical School, and Future of Fish. And before I introduce him officially, I would like you to remember to ask him what his favorite place to eat is in Boston when he's here. You, some of you may be very surprised. The aquarium. Oh. <laughs> Our head chef. This is Chef Tiger, everybody. Wave, wave, wave. <laughs> so please join me in I do it more grizzly style in the tanks, man. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Art Siever. Good evening to you all. Thanks so much for the opportunity to be speaking with you this evening. And by speaking with you, I mean, please feel free to butt in, ask questions, comments, questions, concerns, write down comments. Uh, I'm actually not going to deliver a hour-long speech, but rather probably about half hour I'd like to talk, and really then talk with you, because my work is predicated on understanding how we relate to our natural resources, our natural world, through the products that we take from it. Uh, and so this is necessarily a dialogue about your experience. This is necessarily a dialogue about, about the individuals and uh, the roles that each of us play uh, in the larger species relationship with our natural world. And so uh, my work only gets better and more fulfilled when I actually get to speak with people and people actually interact. So I invite you to ask any question, even if it's about unicorns or, or whatever else that you've been curious about. Um, so with that, uh, I have a rather ridiculous life. Uh, I started off as a chef uh, coming up through the kitchen, scrubbing, scrubbing pots, peeling potatoes, and I never imagined that I would end up being uh, an explorer with National Geographic. Uh, it was not really in my career path or what I imagined for myself, but uh, I really realized that through food we seek uh, a, a very intimate and holistic relationship with many things around us and many things within us. And that passion, that understanding has really drove me out of kitchens. Uh, I had a very good fortune of growing up in a family where we cooked dinner 360 nights a year. And it was fun, it was wonderful, and it was, uh, you know, it was, that was the law, we ate together. But that's where we became a family. That's where we bitched, we whined, we moaned, we gave, we received, we, we, we coalesced into a unit. Uh, we learned to love. Uh, we learned how to disagree, to argue, to agree, to, uh, to where we became individuals as well as, as a unit. Uh, my parents were both very intrepid cooks, uh, and uh, that made it a lot of fun. And uh, this was all predicated on, on kind of the idea that uh, a quote from my, one of my very favorite authors, John Hersey. I read this when I was fairly young, uh, and this is one of his famous books, Blues. It's a conversation between a fisherman and a stranger about the nature of our relationship with our oceans and, and with our natural resources. And then I think he quite humbly and accurately describes, in our quest for food, we begin to find our place in the systems of this world. And what I love about that is that I, I think it's very accurate in that we are not sovereign over our resources, but rather that we are because of them. We live as part of this world, not as an exception to it. And when I was growing up in my neighborhood, uh, in Mount Pleasant in D.C., uh, my, my marine murder spree began very early, uh, but I uh, grew up in a, a very multi-ethnic neighborhood in Washington, D.C. I mean, an exceptionally multi-ethnic neighborhood, uh, just tons of different ethnicities. Uh, we had a lot of uh, embassy workers who lived, lived in the neighborhood, a lot of foreign exchange students, so there was a lot of exchange of information and ideas. 
Uh, it was uh, a neighborhood just adjacent to the 14th Street Corridor that had been bombed out during the riots in 68, and it had never quite recovered. And so low property values encouraged a lot of immigrant families to move in there and became this very, very vital neighborhood. I mean, just alive. Ethiopian, Eritrean, Somalian, Korean, Taiwanese, we had El Salvadorians, we had Guatemalans, Hondureños. I mean, it was, a, it was just a beautiful, fun place. And, uh, you know, my parents would, we, we would do our shopping the way that typical Americans do. We get in our car, we drive to another neighborhood, we load up on the week's worth of goods, and we come home. But my parents were also always willing to, to look, to find something new. And so we'd take that one block walk up to the, uh, to the markets, to the little corner of bodegas, to find whatever we could that was interesting and fun and new. And uh, so throughout my life, food was always a sense of exploration and discovery. And this was uh, further uh, kind of incubated, this idea in me, in that I'd be playing football out in the streets with my brother after school with children of uh, any ethnicity you can imagine. And that, that dinner bell would ring and we'd say goodbye to our friends and we'd run home and we'd find my dad just, just back from work and he'd off his tie and don his apron and be pressing out moistened masa harina dough in a, a little tortilla press. And then he'd be dry frying them in a cast steel pan for made from scratch taco land. And my brother and I were so wondrously enraptured by this, the fact that you know, something so new, so cool, so different to us. I mean, it was a, an exciting exploration, but yet it represented literally thousands of years of cultural history and familial history to the boys and girls that we had just said goodbye to. We began to really understand that food is not only a way to explore what's new, but food is a way to better relate to those that we already know to learn more about the people we already consider friends and family. And that was uh, kind of a fluency I took with me as I grew up, and I was very lucky for that. And dinner uh, is really, I think, the topic that sustainability ultimately always comes back to. Uh, I also had the great fortune of spending my summers down on the Patuxent River, Ches uh, tributary of the Chesapeake Bay. We'd spend a couple of weeks there every summer, and uh, the entire day from sunup to sundown was spent in the quest for food. And it was, it was just a remarkably fun place. A little boy playing in a tidal pool. And every day, the first thing in the morning, we'd run down the pier and scoop up the giant male blue jimmy crabs off the dock, throwing back anything that was that less than five inches in all the females. Because just these giant, bounteous crabs were, were everywhere. We'd take our lines and we'd cast them off the docks and, and reel in, who knows? I mean, it'd perch or pogies, menhaden, skates, rays, sharks, rockfish, bluefish, spots. And whoa, I mean, this was cool. And every other cast, something would come up. I would wait until late in the day when the sun had set to a particular angle that I could see the, uh, the slight bends and curves and hisses on the water as the poisonous water moccasins were uh, uh, peeling through the, uh, the eelgrass in the small little coves that I would go wading through in search of the soft crabs, those delicacies of the Chesapeake Bay. I mean, it was just this wonderful interaction with nature. And as I, uh, as I grew up, I carried a lot of this understanding with me, a lot of this joy in the family communion of it. And when I dropped out of college after approximately 18 minutes, I, uh, yeah, it was actually like two days, but, uh, I, Pardon, I, I did the same thing. That's cool, man. <laughs> now we're both fish murderers. No, Excellent. Like, okay. um, 30 minutes for me. <laughs> and I realized that you know, I needed structure in my life. I needed income. I needed something to do. I needed a way to, uh, to support myself and, and to you know, give myself some time to figure out what was next. It was very easy for me to just fall right into professional kitchens. I was fluent in food already. Why not? It's a perfect place for a young, energetic, uh, ambitious young man. And I could do whatever I want. It was full of adrenaline, full of fun. And uh, it's just a great place to be. And I, uh, I got very lucky as a chef. I worked very, very hard, but I got very lucky. And this is a huge industry, and a lot of really fantastic, talented people jump into this industry trying to make a mark for themselves. And uh, when I was only 25 years old, I had the chance to step out uh, for the first time as an executive chef. And I uh, opened a little place called Cafe St. X. And from there, I, I opened one restaurant a year for about seven years. Uh, restaurants were very kind to me. Uh, the press was very kind to me. And I was very, very lucky for that. Not everybody gets that, that press. Not everybody gets the chance to really put an idea forth. Uh, but when I started off, absolutely, the, first, the best ingredient on the plate, according to me, was, well, in fact, me. 
I was an egotistical, arrogant little brat, and I was attempting to use food to show you how awesome I was. And I was coming out of culinary school, and uh, you know, it was just, it was about kind of trying to find a sense of self. And I found it through trying to wow people and, and manipulating ingredients and, and kind of putting creativity first. Uh, and any good chef who's trying to put the best plate of food out that he or she can starts with the best ingredients. So I was buying locally fresh seasonal ingredients from farmers in the area. Tomatoes, summer ripe at their late August, late September peak. You know, I very quickly began to realize that I, despite my best efforts and creativity and talent, would never best that tomato. So I began to have the humility to be able to take myself a step back from the plate and really allow the ingredients to be first and foremost. And what I realized that I was really enjoying about my time in relationships, in, in, uh, in restaurants, was the relationships that I was forming. It was a remembrance of the relationships that food had always represented to me and my family. It was the relationships with the farmers that were coming through my back door and understanding how my dollars filtered back through an entire community. It was understanding the relationship between the plate that I sent from the kitchen to my guests and how that uh, created friendships and a, a knowing relationship, loyalty and trust. And I really began to, to value that much more. And I also uh, began to take stock of some of my memories and how they played into what I was witnessing at the time. And the species with which whose bounty I was so familiar with as a child the striped bass, the blue crab, the Chesapeake itself, the oyster, uh, they were prohibitively expensive or they were outright gone. Blue crabs were only about this big and they came from Venezuela and they were prohibitively expensive. Striped bass is now protected by the Lacey Act. You know, it was, there was a moratorium. It was commercially extinct as far as anybody was concerned. These fish were gone. And by gone, I don't mean zapped up by aliens. I mean, we ate them and I realized that the guiding hand of natural selection has really become that of the consumer. And that, in fact, is driven by the hand of the cook or the chef. And we get to really understand the role that chefs can play in our modern society. Not only introducing the ideas of communion and of dinner and community, but also the idea of the power that we have over our world in our quest for food. You know, it's, uh, it's really startling when you realize what chefs have, what chefs have done. I mean, we have completely shifted the American perception of what good food is. It is me and my colleagues who put uh, Patagonian toothfish on every menu across the world named Chilean sea bass. It's we who took slime head and decided to call it orange ruffy and decimated that population. It's, it's we right now, it is me and my colleagues who are purposefully extirpating bluefin tuna off these very coasts as we speak. Yeah. You know, these are the actions that we are taking. And if you look at the health index of our society, we're not looking much healthier than our oceans are either. And it's startling that if chefs have the power to make the oceans, the land, and the people that we serve from them sick, it stands to reason that chefs also have the power to heal and to restore. And so it was that belief and conviction that really led me away from restaurants to, uh, to see food with a broader lens, to use it as a window to explore how these issues relate to us in our modern society. And I got a little frustrated, to tell you the truth, because in reading environmental tomes from the founding uh, leaders of thought, from Jefferson to Thoreau, Alby, De Soto, uh, all the way up, Rachel Carson, and reading the greats, also reading the, you know, what was happening now, uh, environmentalism, as, as sort of an industry, as a, as a market term, as almost wholesale been introduced to us as a story of bad human bad. You know, this is how we have impacted ecosystems. Uh, you know, it, it's oftentimes an empirical, eloquent eulogy for our Earth. And it's not very compelling. And it's often based on this idea that something is wrong with nature, and we have to fix it. But I don't believe that's true. Nothing is wrong with nature. Nothing will ever be wrong with nature. There's only something wrong with the way that we are interacting with nature. So if we are the problem, we should be talking about how to fix our behaviors, not how to fix nature. And so rather than talking about the idea of the tragedy of the commons, I talk rather about the idea of the communion of the commons. 
about how nature brings us together, how nature reminds us of how we're all united on this planet, how nature really creates our place in the systems of this world. And this is uh, what's led me to National Geographic, uh, which again was not sort of on the, the stated career path, but uh, it's been an amazing transition for me and a lot of fun. And I run into some truly, truly amazing people. I mean, people that really represent the greatest, some of the greatest thinkers of our century. From Sylvia Earle, Bob Ballard, Jared Diamond, Enrique Sala, uh, you know, people, I've known colleagues with people like uh, Carl Safina and Heather Tossey. I mean, there's just an amazing wealth of compassion and capacity in this, in this place, in National Geographic. And I run into just, just amazing opportunities. But some of my very favorite people that I interact with on a regular basis are the photographers. They're just incredibly brave men and women. Bright, compassionate spirits that are sent out into our world to create a relationship with a culture, a society, a part of the world, or a species that likely you and I are never going to see in person. And they're sent there camera in hand with all their expertise to take a snapshot. And that snapshot then gets broadcast back to us in the pages of that beautiful yellow magazine. That snapshot, a souvenir of, of a relationship that we'll not have, but we are so lucky to be introduced through, to through this through this great institution, National Geographic. And you know, it, it's utterly amazing when you begin to think of some of the things that we're exposed to. Right? How many of us are ever really going to go 3,000 feet under the Southern Oceans with David Dubois to understand what a benthic ecosystem on a seamount really looks like? Probably you. Nice. Not mean that I don't work for the National Geographic magazine. I work for the Missions Program, uh -huh. which is the nonprofit around which the media company is based. So, but there are things coming. You know, how many of us will ever bank through the glacial hills of Alaska with Brian Scary, you know, a, a Boston, a Boston uh, Waltham uh, resident here, one of my favorite people in the world. It was just here a couple weeks ago. You know, banking through these glacial hills in search of the grizzlies, watching the, the truly greatest migration as the incredible amounts of salmon stream up into these tiny little waterways, bringing with them all the nutrients from the ocean that then allows this tundra forest to exist. I mean, it's just an amazing thing. How many of us are ever going to you know, put on our backpacks and our hiking boots and go tromping through the, the spice plantations of Madagascar and understand and really provoke in ourselves an understanding of the history of colonialism and the development and evolution of our globalized palates. Not many of us. But how many of us have eaten Chilean sea bass that comes from that seamount 3,000 feet down? How many of us have ever sprinkled a little bit of black pepper on our uh, Alaskan salmon steak? I'd say most of us. And whereas National Geographic sends an expert eye in witness to our world, so too do we. But we send our forks in our stead. This is our window. This is our relationship to our planet. And what's great about it is that it's about dinner. And this is delicious. And delicious is the Esperanto of our world. It's a language that everybody see speaks. It's a language that everybody seeks. And it's something that we need and encourage in our lives. And what is funny about my role at National Geographic is that I, I, I represent a, a kind of a new generation of thinking about this. The, the era of the gentlemanly explorer around which the society, society was initially founded is over. We've dove most of the depths. We, we've climbed the heights. We've flown the distances. We've put a man on the moon. You know, we've explored much of our world, and we understand quite a bit about it. And while there's certainly more to explore about our world, new species to find, new systems to understand, uh, neutrinos and measuring their new speeds that we thought not possible, I think that while there's plenty new information out there, the next great leap in the evolution of our understanding of our place in the systems of this world won't come from discovering something new, but rather in relating to what we already know about our planet and our place in the systems here. And what I like about that is that uh, dinner is the way, is I think the most common way that we have to begin to uh, examine that relationship. My uh, great friend and mentor, Dr. Carl Safina, founder of the Blue Ocean Institute, publisher of many books and just general amazing person, uh, in one of the books that he published last year, uh, his quote said, we were a hunter-gatherer culture. From there we became 
an agrarian society. From agrarian, we became a civilized society. The next great leap in our evolution will be for us to go from civilized to humanized. That's a really startling, startling comment. What I like about it, though, is I don't know of anything that is more human than the ritual of dinner. We are, in fact, the only species on this planet that ritualizes feeding, that participates in communion while we are feeding. And dinner is our opportunity not only to better understand our place in the systems of this world, but also to remind ourselves of why it's truly beautiful to be human. I mean, dinner is usually the best part of my day. That's, that's a pretty cool thing to think about. But through dinner, we seek to feed a very complicated hunger. And we, we've forgotten this. Through dinner, we've reduced dinner down to just an amalgam of calories, to a, a basic level of nutrients that we need to absorb throughout the course of the day, to a, just a refueling session, basically. But through dinner, just as I did when I was a child, I fed the hunger for companionship and for identity. In our society, through dinner, we seek jobs and wellness, health, culture, you know, heritage, uh, identity, to convene with our, with our forebears. I mean, there's, there's an amazing amount of needs that we feed through a simple act of eating. And I want to talk to you about uh, some of the stories of dinner that I've seen from around the world in my travels with National Geographic, and, uh, and then kind of finish out on a little bit of the context of what sustainable dialogue is, what I think it's really purposed with, and, and some of the changes that I think we as consumers need to begin to see. When I was uh, about 22, 23, somewhere in there, I was working as a chef up in Spain in a tiny little town called um, Luca Nina de los Torres. And uh, it was a tiny town of 85 people. Five of them were under 85, and they were all 80. Uh, there was a little one Michelin star restaurant there that I was helping to run, and it was an amazing time. And I had a donkey, I had a forager, I had a garden, I had a farmer, I had a hunter, a fisherman, and just participated in this wonderful, bounteous area of the world. And it was just fun. And I really enjoyed it. I really understood what cooking from culture really was about. And really identifying with the source of ingredients. I, uh, my tenure there came to a close. And I went down a little tour through the Sherry Triangle, Jerez de la Frontera, into uh, San Lucar de Baramea, and uh, out onto the, eastern co uh, the western coast of Spain on the Atlantic Ocean. Spent some time over there. And then I was heading down to a little town called Algeciras. Uh, and it's an ugly industrial town, and I was just passing through, and I realized that uh, I was reading my hostel guide and found out that the hostel I was supposed to stay at was closed for the season. This is about February. And, um, oh crap, what am I going to do? And at that point, in a bit of youthful enthusiasm, I, the bus I was on pulled, into, pulled up, stopped, and I kind of looked around and said, well, heck with it, let's go. Grabbed my bag, jumped off, ran into the building, had a, a very strange, kind of harsh, provocative interaction with a guy behind a glass window and I, I handed a ticket and then I got run down the hall and I ran up a, a gangway and doors closed behind me, engines fired, and two hours later I'm in Africa. Uh, and there's youth here so I won't repeat what I said when I figured this out. Uh, and I'm probably not the first person to have ever ended up in Africa by accident, but it can happen. It happened to me, so it can happen to you. You warned. <laughs> I uh, started off in a tiny little town called Ciuta. It's the, one of the last Spanish enclaves on the, co on, uh, on the continent of Africa. It's a beautiful little colonial town. And I uh, was told that there was a bus right across the border, and I could just hop on the bus, go down to Tetuan, a uh, little town about 10 kilometers down, and uh, just find my way through there and get into Morocco. So I crossed the border, and I, I got there and went through the whole thing, and I started walking down towards the bus stop. And some soldier with a machine gun pointed at me. He was like, what do you think you're doing? I know, I'm just walking to the bus stop. I didn't know bus stop. Oh, okay, well, I'll just walk down to Tetuan then. It's about 10 kilometers. And he was like, yeah, 150. So, stuck out my thumb and kind of got on a real slow train all the way down <laughs> through the coast. Uh, ended up in Rabat, down into Casablanca, up into Marrakesh. From Marrakesh, I went out into the desert uh, through Ever and Mahamid, these tiny little back backwood, well, back desert towns. And I went out with this Berber tribe out into the desert. We went all the way over into Algeria and then come, came down into uh, Western Sahara and then up the coast again when I got back into civilization. And I ended up um, landing in a little town called Iswira, 
It was a beautiful, beautiful little town. It's the white-walled arts capital of Morocco. And it's just as pretty of a picture as you will ever see. And I would spend my days uh, wandering around kind of the Medinas, these old markets. And then just for somebody whose career was literally training myself on sensorial details, to walk around. And this is about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Yes, it's winter under an African sun near the equator, but that's the light quality because of all those sexy, sultry, seductive, spicy smells that are pluming up out of, out of little cook stoves and, and the leather tannery that was over here that you tried to avoid the smells of and the little pots of boiling snails and fresh squeezed orange juice that would blow your mind. And just all of these smells, it was cool, and, and these markets and people are selling this and that, black market and whatever. And, you know, I was just so inspired by this and just got totally lost within the culture. And I would spend most of my days right along the, these white walls, the ramparts that protected the city from the buffeting winds of the trade winds that, that hit the coast there and just created enormous surf. And there, uh, uh, perched on top, were these little charcoal shacks. And men would just set up these fires, and fishermen would come in on these little boats, and they'd drop off some fish, and they'd just cook it up right there for you, right on top of the grill. And, and you'd just season it with nothing but a sprinkling of seawater. And as it evaporated, those salt crystals would would form on the outside of the fish, and that was your seasoning. It was served with local olive oil and just a ubiquitous relish in Western Africa of chopped pepper, tomato, and onion. And it was just a beautiful thing. It was fun. And I didn't speak their language, but I was able to communicate with these men because we did have something in common. Food. You know, we spoke of fire and of fish. We talked of olive oil and soccer. We, we whispered of uh, women and illicit wine in this Muslim country. We found our communing points, and we began to discuss, and we became friends, and I created relationships with these guys through that. And then I began to get to know the guys on the boats, the fishermen who were bringing their catch, the guys who were feeding me. It was a lot of fun. And I actually ended up starting going out on the boats with them. I ended up spending a, a couple of months working as a sardine fisherman. And it was just an amazing experience. These tiny little boats, some of them like this, more uh, kind of robot style, some of them long pirogues, the 19-foot canoes that have been used since time immemorial on the western coast for fishing. And these guys would just row out every day through this pounding eight-foot surf, tossed around without a care in the world because, well, their great-great-great-grandfathers had done this successfully, and so had they, generations in between. And they'd perch there, pranced on the bows of these boats, in this tossing, boiling sea with bodies like Barishnikov. I mean, just taut, tense, beautiful in the, in the human strength and struggle. And they'd wait for just some minuscule little flicker under, under, the, under the water that I never, never was able to read. And within just a, a sharp shotgun burst of, a, of, a, of emotion, out this body would spring out like a coil and this whole net would be cast. And it was incredible. And these nets were cast, cast in hopes of catching only just a few fish, though. And that little trickle under the water was uh, the tail of an anchovy being chased by a mackerel. And these nets would usually yield a couple of sardines every now and then. Some of the mackerel in chase would be caught once or twice a week. A small little tuna would come up. And what was amazing to me is these guys were really celebrating what they were so fortunate to catch. And they were out there casting nets in hopes of catching dinner and not dollars. And this was their livelihood. That first fish that they caught went, not to me, but to their family. And each cast carried with it the needs of an entire community. And it's something that, even though I grew up in a, in a, a very, you know, I had everything I needed. We didn't have everything we wanted. But this is the first time that I've really participated in, in the fundamental nature of, of our quest for food. And I began to realize that even I, with a, with a good conscience, and somebody that really thinks about this stuff, didn't feel as fortunate as I should have about this. And it really disturbed me when I came back to America, and it really came with me, these ideas that, that fish is, you know, our quest for food is really about us, first and foremost. Fishing is a humanitarian action. I mean, this is about feeding. There's a nobility, a beauty, a joy, a camaraderie in that that is so noble just as the, the agrarian hero is so noble in his cause. And this is the foundations of our, of our thought. And I really began to realize that fishermen are, are the purpose. I mean, a fishery doesn't exist until a fisherman puts forth effort. 
And so it, it has largely contextualized the way that I think about seafood and our relationship with our oceans. But it also made me think about uh, how we think about food in America. There's a, a very popular political slogan that was uh, thrown around quite a bit with, uh, you know, I promise a chicken in every pot, Harry Truman. And this is, uh, you know, a quote that everybody kind of knows in one way or another. Uh, but it's actually a, a misquote of Henry V saying, for my subjects, I wish a chicken in every pot on Sundays. Thankfully, we've done away with the subjects part. But we've also, unfortunately, done away with the Sundays part. And we put a chicken in every pot every day of the week. And it's brought with it disastrous consequences, not only for the environment, but for ourselves as well. And what I think is, is the lesson I learned from this is that we really need to re-examine what we think we need. And we need to apply that and be, apply that behavioral aspect to the sustainability environmental dialogue. But these are not new thoughts. Uh, I'm not a particularly religious person, so forgive me if I um, don't do justice to the, this example, but in the Bible, there is you know, one of the great uh, stories told from the Bible is that of loaves and fishes. That Jesus goes to the seashore to preach, and the masses just throng to him more than anybody expected. And then somebody in that crowd has the really, really bad idea of saying, Hey, I'm hungry. You got anything to eat? And everybody was like, Oh, yeah, you got something to eat? And Jesus said, Oh. And this boy, little boy, proffered up three fish and five loaves of bread. And from this, one of the great miracles of the Bible is told, which is that Jesus was able to feed the masses, thousands of people, from just a few loaves and a few fish. Furthermore, he instructed his disciples to gather the crumbs so that nothing might be wasted. Whoa, what an idea. Now, we live in a world where we can't make more fish. We can't make more bread. We can't plow under more arable land, and we can't find new species out there. And I think that this story from the Bible is a really good allegory of where we are right now. Seven billion people this month thronging to that seashore, expecting to get fed. Nine billion by you know, some point in this century. So what is the replicable miracle of this story? Well, as I said, it's not to create more fish, but rather I think it's to look at how we can begin to better utilize the fish that we already have. To really look at the resources in front of us and find efficiencies and find behavioral values, find human values in them that seek to feed a more holistic, complicated hunger. One of the uh, other travels that I did recently, uh, my wife and I were hired by the uh, I was hired by the Victorinox Corporation to come and do some work for them over in Switzerland. And it was a really fun time. And uh, Switzerland is actually really boring because everything works precisely. So there's no chaos that Americans are kind of used to. And so the, the preciseness of it actually kind of leads you to feel a little uncomfortable, but also kind of really jealous. Uh, and we spent most of our time in Zurich, and we got up into the mountains one day. We uh, came up through Ivakschwitz and up into the mountains past Lake Interlach, and, and we came up into this little tiny town called Frutigen. And Frutigen is the site of a really a very remarkable project. Uh, as you see in the background there, the Swiss Alps, it's this little tiny hamlet nestled into the beautiful, beautiful scenery. I mean, it looked like you could poke it with a needle and the whole thing would just deflate. It just didn't look real. And uh, yeah, it's a tiny little hamlet where things smell like mountain air and, and you hear the Ricola horns and you know the slow sway of cowbells. And it's, it's pretty much what you could imagine in rural Switzerland. But uh, this is the last town before you hit uh, a big mountain pass. And then it separates two cantons or two states in Switzerland. And there's a project uh, to bore a tunnel through one of these giant mountains in order to enable better intercanton trade, to enable better tourism, and just to basically help better connect Switzerland. And uh, while they were boring through this tunnel, they found, uh, they tapped into a geothermally heated spring. And through either side of the tunnel, poured out about 100 liters per second of about 69, 70 degree water. And this is a big problem. And in years past, we would have just let it flow off, and we wouldn't have done the environmental impact study, and that would have been that. But on one side of the mountain, they said, you know, the water coming out right here, what's the chance that it's 70 degrees in temperature? Eh, not so good. It's actually more like 39 and a half. So they built this big energy intensive plant through which they, they remove the heat energy from the water and they pass it off into the ecosystem, crystal clear, and just at the right temperature. So they're not going to kill the whole uh, microfauna and flora and, uh, of the ecosystem. Great, good thinking. 
But on the other side of the mountain, there's this Romanian guy, one of the engineers on the project, who says, huh, ah, that's 70 degree water. I got all I can use of 70 degree water. We gotta do something with this. I'm gonna build a greenhouse. Because, you know, when I think of mountain hamlets in Switzerland, I think of bananas. I mean, duh, don't you? I mean, really? So he built this greenhouse in which he's now growing bananas. And everybody thought he was bananas. Well, he's now growing bananas for an entire co-op system. Co-op is the largest grocery store in Switzerland. And they're, they're getting local bananas from this guy in this little greenhouse here. And he said, well, okay, well, I got bananas. And now I'm growing mangoes and, and some other things in there. What, I still got this water. What am I going to do with it? Caviar. That's the other thing that just, you know, not chocolate. Swiss caviar, that's it. So he built this sturgeon farm. He's got 60,000 head of Siberian sturgeon in here. All harvestable weight, about 35 pounds. Just this past September, he, uh, he harvested his first uh, year class of row bearing females to produce the first caviar. All of the males are sold as fresh meat. The remaining meat off the females is sold into a value added market of pates and smoked products. Totally cool. And they go through a series of UV filtrations and a couple other things that by the end of the day, this water is about a quarter of a degree above the temperature centigrade that it should be to enter into the environment. And it's just as crystal clear as it was the day it came out of the, uh, out of the mountain. So the water goes off into the ecosystem like nothing ever happened. Now, the sturgeon has a few issues with it, with a little bit of fish feed and stuff. But if you look at the total fish in conversion out ratio on this one, whoa, pretty cool. Then he, he didn't stop there. He opened a restaurant. Then he opened another restaurant. And then he opened a museum. And in the museum, he's got a, a whole exhibit on geothermal heating. He's got an exhibit about the global spice trade. Because he's got in his greenhouse now growing cinnamon bark and nutmeg, cloves, and spices. And just the totally whacked out experience of going from clean, crystal clear alpine air into the dank, dense, dank, humid, sultry smells of spice planting. Whoa, talk about, like, I uh, just can't handle this. And it's just an amazing experience. He's taken advantage of this. And with these two restaurants, with the sturgeon farm, with the museum, by the way, 200,000 German tourists pile onto buses every year and drive through that same tunnel to come see this guy. This guy who's a little bit bananas. Well, this guy is providing energy for other industries within the town. He's become a boon to everybody else around him. He's created 85 jobs. He's creating hundreds of thousands of pounds of meat and bananas for nearly an entire nation. 85 jobs, 200,000 tourists, education. And at the end of the day, his environmental impact for his environmental take, all negligible. And this really leads me to what I think sustainability is all about. It's not about finding more resources. It's about creativity in the face of decline, and it's about figuring out how to better feed people with the products that we already have, as this Romanian gentleman uh, exemplified so well. And I really think that if we have eaten, if we agree that we have eaten our way into a, this crisis that we're in, specifically with our oceans, it can be argued that we can eat our way out of it. And I think we need to then use that understanding to look at the purpose of the sustainability dialogue. Um, I'm going to start off by saying that I think sustainability, sustainable as a word, is a, it's a good term. It is where we are right now. It has reached a consumer point where it is an acceptable term. But sustainable as a term defines something basically that resembles perpetual consumption. And I don't think that exists. I'm not sure sustainable really exists. It's a great goal. It's a laudable platform to put up there is where we want to go. But it doesn't really offer much of an operating paradigm. Because right now, we're not doing so well. So if sustainable is our goal, how do we laud progress in between? How do we monetize incremental change? How do we evoke the emotional response of a return in the investment of the act of eating, not only for ourselves, but for our planet as well. The dinner is not just taking from our world, but it's a chance to actually give back, to invest in our planet. And as sustainable seafood is marketed to consumers, uh, I think is, is a little hollow in a way. 
we have green list, yellow list, red list. And it was the klaxon bell that was sound you know, years ago in order for us to wake up and see that we need to change. And this was cool, and it offered us an opportunity. But it sold as, hey, eat the green list. And what I think of that is that it's a decidedly do no harm approach. I mean, we're currently not doing very well, so continue, you know, not doing any harm doesn't really get us anywhere. And in fact, it weakens us. So, you know, I, I relate sustainable sort of green list to a, a cancer diagnosis. Hey, you've got lung cancer and, and your, your response action is to quit smoking. And that's it. It's sort of, okay, well, I, I won't continue to hurt myself, but I'm not going to do anything to really restore my health. We're not going to have an aggressive plan of action that's actually going to get me better. And that's where we need to be thinking, is about this process of restoration. Because to me, the real purpose of sustainable dialogue, it's not about the green list, but rather about changing the fate of the species in the yellow and the red. It's about making prof, uh, fisheries profitable again. And really, as a, as a social idea, sustainable doesn't have any, any appeal. I mean, it relies on fear and guilt in order to maintain the status quo. And in a cultural and economical sense, for people that only value growth as, 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 a, as a vehicle, as, as an understanding, you know, we were talking about this at dinner. Uh, our purpose in life is to give our children a better life, is for them to eat more of or better than we have. And if that's our purpose, then sustaining isn't going to get us anywhere. And I think the words are really very limiting because you have unsustainable and sustainable, but we're not valuing in between. And that's really where I think uh, restoration comes into play. You know, we really begin to rely on and utilize the assets that we have, which are fishermen and consumer dollars and a capitalist system that can really drive change. Uh, some of you in this room might remember Crystal Pepsi when it came out. It was uh, about 91 through 93, somewhere in there. And Pepsi Clear Coke also debuted on the market about that time. And it was amazing. It was, it was a, a, a revolutionary thing. In terms of a marketing campaign, you know, they spent a lot of money on this. These are big corporations. Coke is not used to failing. And they went out there, Crystal Pepsi. And it was, we've revolutionized soda, the Magna Carta, Declaration of Independence, and now Crystal Pepsi. You know, and that's how it was sold to Americans. And we waited with bated breath to get our first sip of it. Like it was a, you know, a, the next installation of Star Wars, and we waited to, 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 to be a part of this magnificent moment of history. And we got our first sip, and we said, wow, this tastes just like Pepsi. Oh, okay, whatever. And Crystal Pepsi, Clear Coke, they were on the market for like three months. Total failure. And what I think that this represents is, even with the marketing capacity and success rate of Coke and Pepsi, if they can't get us to change our behaviors, to get what we already have, then no one will. And that's how we sell sustainability, with unprecedented global collaboration, with an unheralded political and scientific consensus, with a huge amount of good luck, with a radical shift in the consumptive patterns of our societies. The reward for that is that the cod that is on sale today in my local market will be on sale again tomorrow. That doesn't really inspire action. It doesn't really inspire engagement. So, if the news about our oceans isn't good, why are we using a term that implies perfect to sell what we really need to be talking about is when we're getting better? And uh, we really need that wholesale shift in, in the dialogue to talk about restore it, restoring fish populations, even as we continue to take from them. We need to begin to talk about restoring the pride, prudence and profitability of fishing communities and of their role in our society and in our culture, and to really begin to herald and laud them. We need to restore a habitat that's vital in order to maintain profitable fisheries, and we need also to restore our faith in aquaculture so that technological advances can take place at the speed of capitalism and not at the speed of policy and regulation. But ultimately, I think we need, as I learned in Africa, to restore our sense of expectation of what we feel we deserve from this world. I really, truly believe that this planet can provide for the needs of seven billion people. This planet can provide for the needs of the coming nine billion. I don't doubt this, but this world will never provide for the desires of seven billion people. It will never provide for the desires of the coming nine. 
And if it's us that we need to fix, then it's our expectations we need to start with. You know, and this is where it all comes back to the dinner table. We need to expect different things from our food. We need to expect smaller portions of a more diverse protein. Uh, we need to expect a lot more vegetables. We need to expect a lot more communion and human values and health from our food. And we as consumers really need to begin to understand that we all have a role to play in this with every dollar that we spend. And that uh, you know, the rewards for doing so are, are delicious. And that's a pretty cool place to start. And it's a nice reward. And uh, I think for too long, the sustainability dialogue has really been relegated to a product by product reference point. This farm salmon is, is not sustainable. This wild Alaskan salmon is. This grass-fed steak is sustainable. However, this corn-fed grass, uh, you know, corn-fed Nebraska CAFO beef is not. Fossil fuels are not sustainable, but contemporary energy is. Whatever the resource extraction that we're talking about here, the same sentiment applies. It's not just the products that we use, but it's also about how we use them. We can have highly sustainable products, products that really represent uh, a nearly perfect systems and cycles and economics and, and opportunities and cultural development. But if we take those perfect aquaculture shrimp from Belize that are carbon neutral, fair trade certified, rainforest certified, shipped frozen, done in just the most beautiful, holistic, fun, imaginable way possible, technologically advanced, but then we go ahead and ship them up here and put them on Shrimp Fest, on the all-you-can-eat shrimp buffet, we failed at the human aspect of sustainability. I got the product right, but we didn't get the use right. And we must incubate a dialogue about our behavior equally as much as we incubate a dialogue about our production models. We need to combine the emotional and the empirical and really enable consumers to have a context for the decisions that we make on a daily basis. And uh, at the end, dinner is, is a full contact relationship with our world. It is an intimate and celebratory act for many reasons on many levels. And uh, so in closing here, I'd, I'd just like to leave you with a benediction. Uh, something to remember maybe the next time you gather with friends and family, or maybe even when you're eating alone, which is to eat with care and be mindful of the environmental impact of your choices. To eat with joy and you know, celebrate that we can still participate in the bounty of this world. And ultimately, to eat together, to remind us of what truly unites all of us on this beautiful, mostly blue planet. So thanks. I appreciate it.